the lengthy book, uh, but you see it there on page one. Incidentally, if you've not turned in anything from Isaiah, I would like to have that so that I can grade it and get it back to you. Um, because of the constraints of our time, we're going to cover Jeremiah and Lamentations, these notes tonight. If we have any extra time tonight, we may do some of this, but probably next week we will back up and hit a few of the high places in Jeremiah and in the book of Lamentations before we move on to the ever-exciting book of Ezekiel. And uh, that is going to be an interesting book. But let's look at Jeremiah. I've given you the theme. It is the revelation of God in the midst of failure. All right? And I want you to understand something, and you'll find this just a little bit later because I put it there that... Jeremiah was written almost 100 years after Isaiah, right? So what Isaiah was predicting, Jeremiah is witnessing the fulfillment in his lifetime, all right? He is seeing the destruction of Jerusalem. He is seeing Babylon come in. He has seen the deportation of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah and Daniel as they've been taken into captivity. He's watched all of those things. And understand that when Babylon came in, they didn't take everybody the first time. They took the cream of the crop. And as more rebellion took place, they came in and took more people until the captivity finally completely exhausted itself and only the poor were left in the land. And so Jeremiah is dealing with that. It's not just preaching to people about what's going to happen. They are living in it. They're living in it. And there's a special revelation from God that only comes in the midst of, of failure. Some things you can never learn if you don't fail. Do you believe it's in the will of God that you fail sometimes? Yeah, it absolutely is. The Bible speaks about the Holy Spirit, and I wanted to read this in Isaiah, but we didn't get a chance to, about the Holy Spirit blows upon the grass and the grass withereth. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit makes things dry up in your life. Destroys things. There is this idea, and I had a woman tell me that, tell me this the other day. If God's in it, you know it's going to succeed. You know it's going to succeed if God's in it. <laughs> well tell John the Baptist that God was in it and they cut his head off. <laughs> tell the Apostle Paul that. Tell all the saints of Hebrews chapter eleven that God was in all of that, but they didn't always succeed. See, I'm not, God has not promised me success. He promised to use me in his plan to accomplish his will. And if my failure is necessary to accomplish his ultimate goal, then so be it. What am I? Can the clay say to the potter, why doest thou with me thus? You know, you need to read a book called To the Golden Shore. It's the story of Adoniram Judson, the first American missionary. And he went to the wonderful place of Burma, Myanmar is what we call it now. He was there nearly five years before he won one convert. Five years. Isn't Pastor Matt approaching his five-year anniversary here? Is he near that? What if he preached here for five? Is he already at five years? All right. But it's between five and six now. All right. What if he preached here for five years and nobody came to church and nobody got saved? Would he consider himself a success? And I'm Judson began to translate the Bible into Burmese. And because he was a foreigner in international tension, they caught him and they threw him into a vile prison. And he was in there for years, years suffering in there. And yet God used him to finish that Burmese Bible. And there are people, missionaries, people that are saved in Myanmar today because of the witness of Adonai Judson. But from the immediate perspective, he did not appear to be successful. All right. Let me just go ahead and remind you that there is a fallacy today that God desires us to be fruitful. Bear fruit, bear fruit. And they get that from John chapter 15, and I understand, all right? What is it? What kind of fruit are we supposed to produce? All right, we say the fruit of the Spirit. Notice those are not the fruits of the Christian. They're the fruits of the Spirit. We're the channel through which that fruit is produced. In fact, he said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Bring forth fruit. Well, what is producing the fruit, the branch or the vine? 
the vine, through the branches. All right, so the fruitfulness is the work of the Spirit in our life and is not always a tangible thing. What does God demand of me and you? Not to be fruit, fruitful. To be faithful. That's the difference. All right? Be faithful when you run three people as if you're running 3,000. Be faithful. Be faithful. When we get to heaven, this numbers-based success rate by which we judge one another is all going to be eradicated. And I think some of the most rewarded individuals in heaven will be that bivocational pastor who stayed in one place for 50 years and gave his life to the people that are around him. And nobody ever heard about him, and nobody invited him to preach in revivals, and he never got on the radio, but he stayed right where God wanted him to do week after week after week, and he fed those people, and he loved them and gave his very life for them. That's what God's looking for. That's the main thing. Now, he may let you pastor James 5,000 people. He may. He may have you pastor 15 for 15 years. He may. Because he knows what's best for you. And you've got to get well beyond that idea of how man judges your work. How man judges it. Yeah, that numbers mean success. No, faithfulness means success. And that's all God is looking for from us. And he enables us to be faithful. And it's through the failure sometimes that we learn most about God. I don't mean that in any way to, to, to advocate us sinning so that God, grace may abound. God forbid. You know, Paul's pretty clear on that point. All right, We don't do those things. But sometimes God allows us to stumble and fall flat on our face because we need it. We need it. And way too proud, way too confident, way too self-reliant. And the best way to make a man not self-reliant is to cut him off at his knees. After you end up with a skin-up chin 14 times in a row, you begin to learn. All right, you begin to learn. You ever seen a dog run across the yard at you? And he had a collar around his neck with a little box. And he's running in ferociousness towards you. And all of a sudden he comes to a screeching halt and looks at you. Why? Because he crossed that line enough times to know that if he did it again, it's going to shock the fire out of him. And so he'll stop right here, right here. That's, that's how we learn, all right? We cross it, we cross it, cross it. <laughs> Finally, in humility, I recognize my failure. But God has a special revelation in failure. And he's present in this threefold way in the book of Jeremiah. He's present, of course, in the judgment of sin. Jeremiah is very clear on that. And he is present in the suffering that sin has caused. And he's also present in his ultimate victory over sin. Summer, do you not know where we are on the paper? Oh, just flip it to, I'm right under Jeremiah, the, the, the name Jeremiah. I just saw you flip it. I want to make sure you're with me. All right. Jeremiah's name means the Lord exalts, although that is in somewhat of a dispute. He was a priest by birth, which means he was from what tribe? Levi. All right. But he did not exercise his office. He had no known family. He lived a life of loneliness as Christ did. He began his ministry in the 13th year of Josiah's reign, about 100 years after Isaiah. You know, all those prophecies that God made in Isaiah, he gave his people 100 years. It's an amazing thing, the long-suffering of God. He is known as the weeping prophet. He's a contemporary with Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Daniel. Of course, Daniel being in Babylon, he went into captivity and then he was released and he went to Egypt and he died in Egypt, some people think, by martyrdom. Word-wise, Jeremiah is the longest book in the Bible, even longer than the Psalms, word-wise, right? Covers a period of 41 years. Prophecies concerning Judah and Jerusalem, the first 25 chapters. There's biographical data referring to Jeremiah and prophecies of redemption in the coming messianic age through chapter 45. There are oracles regarding the various nations, and there's a historical appendage uh, there in chapter 52. One thing you need to remember, though, when you read Jeremiah is that it's not always in chronological order. I've given you an example of that, that chapters 21 and 24 refer to a period in Zedekiah's reign, while chapter 5 refers to something in Jehoiakim's administration, which was earlier than that. And uh, so 
with some speculation, I've given you a little outline there of the kings that certain passages deal with. Some of it's not 100% clear, and some of those passages would refer to a broader range or be applicable more, to more than just one king. And uh, so you kind of keep that in mind, and I'll let you go over some of that on your own, right? Notice some things about the book. Thirteen times Jeremiah calls Judah a backsliding people. Fifty-three times he says they have committed iniquity or sin or some transgression. Now, if a preacher is preaching to you and 53 times he tells you that you're sinning, you kind of get the message a little bit, all right? Forty-seven times he tells them to return. Fourteen times he tells them they would be scattered, and 51 times they're going to be in captivity or be captive by the Babylonians. In fact, Babylon is referred to more times in the book of Jeremiah than the whole rest of the Bible put together. All right, because he's living right in the midst of all of those things. All right, a lot of prophecy in Jeremiah. The 70 years of the Babylonian captivity are foretold. The fact that the captivity will not have a full end, but the Jews will return from Babylon. Eventually, Babylon itself will fall. The righteous branch, the Messiah, will come to earth and provide a new covenant by means of which all nations may be potentially saved. Jeremiah is the most persecuted prophet in the Bible. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. His brethren dealt treacherously with him. He was confronted by false prophets. His brethren cursed him. He was smitten, put in stocks, and denounced. His heart was broken. He was seized and threatened with death. His teaching was opposed. He was in prison. He was pursued. He was beaten and imprisoned again. He was thrown into a dungeon. He was bound in chains. He was falsely accused. He was taken to Egypt, and there he was stoned. What a success by man's standards. Verse number four. The book of Jeremiah testifies quite eloquently to the biblical doctrine of inspiration. First, Jeremiah himself reflects a very high regard for biblical documents. For instance, some 66 pages, passages sorry, from the book of Deuteronomy are echoed in about 86 references in the book. All right, so he's quoting from the rest of the Bible. Second, his narrative claims prophetic inspiration over and over again. 151 times he says, the word of the Lord came. What is he trying to illustrate to his listeners? It's not me. <laughs> it's not me. Now, you've heard the expression, don't shoot the messenger. And the way they treated him, do you think they, they kept that? <laughs> they were busy trying to kill the messenger. He says, it's not me. 151 times, God said this, all right? He's designated as Jeremiah the prophet in the New Testament. Now, what's interesting about that? What is it that you have to be in order to be called a prophet according to the book of Deuteronomy? 100% accurate, all right, in order to hold the name of prophet. If you missed it by one time, nobody has to listen to you, the book of Deuteronomy says. If you make a prophecy and that does not come to pass, you don't have to be afraid of you. You are not really a prophet, all right? See these psychic readings and stuff that you can get. I saw a little sign today, 50% off a psychic reading. 50% off. Wow, all right? You think she, think she bats, a, I assume it's a woman, you think she bats a thousand? You think she's got it right every single time? No, I'll waste my time with that foolishness. All right? I wouldn't do that at all. She's not a prophet. Jeremiah was a prophet and called such in the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews cites from Jeremiah 31 31 and attributes that declaration to God. All right? In the Greek text of the United Bible Society, it lists about 96 occurrences, concurrences between the book of Jeremiah and the New Testament. All right. What does that prove for us? Yeah, that the inspiration of God, that these books written hundreds of years apart have such fluidness and cohesion between them. You take 1,500 years and give 40 different authors the opportunity to write, and all of that comes together in perfect harmony, complementing one another. You can only say one thing, that God wrote that book. All right. That's what we believe. All right, notice a few quick things. The book stresses the omniscience of God. You know what passage I'm referring to? Anybody? That's exactly right. All right. God tells Jeremiah, He said, Jeremiah, I called you. Notice chapter 1, if you're there in the book of Jeremiah. I hope your Bible's open to Jeremiah. We're talking about that book. 
verse 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. What does that tell us about the womb and what's inside the womb? It's life. And God said, well, the soul, God said, I knew you, and I set you apart from my purpose. My purpose. I've heard people, even Christians, say that, you know, it's not a baby till it takes a breath because God breathed into them and they became a living soul. That's a reference to Adam when God made him out of the dust of the ground. But you can't call a a, a blob of tissue, you can't call a, a just some flesh in a womb and know it by name and sanctify it to a purpose unless it has the individuality of a soul. Everything else is just the skin in which the soul exists. So one of the most powerful verses against abortion and that whole idea of what goes on in the womb, that they're not alive until they're born, is just crazy. In fact, we see this repeated again in the life of Elizabeth and Mary. Elizabeth being the mother of John the Baptist. I do not clearly understand all of this, but the Bible says that when John the Baptist heard Mary talk, he leaped in his mother's womb. I don't know how you leap in the womb anyway, but it was enough that Elizabeth, yeah, Elizabeth felt it enough, and you know, I've never experienced that, thank the Lord, but uh, she felt that leaping at the sound of Mary's voice, and the Bible records that, all right? And understanding all that's going on there and that, that Jeremiah and John the Baptist are ordained from the womb for a particular thing. And then notice further on, verse 6, Then said I, Ah, oh Lord God, I, I cannot speak, I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And the Lord put forth his hand, touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my words in thy mouth. All right, Jeremiah said, I, I, I can't talk. God said, Don't worry about that. He said, You just go tell them, and I'll put the words in your mouth, and don't be afraid of what they say. Who else said that? Who else had that excuse? Moses. Yeah, I can't. I can't talk. God said, okay, I'll send Aaron with you to help you. And they get to Egypt, and do you ever hear Aaron say a single word? He never says a single word. Moses does all the talking, all right, because God took over the situation. What, what is it tomorrow that will help me from this passage? What is it that will help me from this passage tomorrow when I go to preach? Yeah, don't be afraid of their faces. Just get up and say what God told you to say, and then sit down, all right? used to always judge my preaching by the response I got to it. Finally, I'm learning, look, say what God told you to say and just sit down. If they like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. That's not my responsibility. I'm just supposed to be a faithful servant and deliver it. Now, yes, I care about people and how they respond. And yes, I want to see them respond to the truth because it's for their own good. But at the end of the day, my requirement is to be faithful. Your requirement is to respond to the truth as, as it has been presented. And I can't be afraid of you, all right? But notice God's omniscience. He knew Jeremiah long before he was even born. He knows you as well, all right? When one is willing to be used in the service of God, I'm in number two at the bottom of the page, God takes his weakness and turns it into a strength. Jeremiah was a timid, sensitive youth who initially shrunk from the awesome responsibility with which he was challenged. But he, came, he became one of the, the Lord's greatest, most courageous men. As you read the book of Jeremiah, you'll see some of the things he suffered. They put him in a pit, in a miry pit. They had to let him down with a rope into the jail. All right? That's how nasty it was down in there. And, and uh, it just kept him locked up and all. It was, it was awful the way they treated him. Yet he was a bold preacher for the Lord. When a nation forsakes his covenant vows to God and pursues religious activity not sanctioned by him, and aid from worldly powers, he has committed a grievous evil. He must abandon the faults and return to the true. Notice that these people in Judah were not non-religious. They were religious. They just weren't doing things God's way. They were doing it their way. And God is not interested in religion for religion's sake. In fact, number four says external religion without the devotion of the heart is worthless. Shallow formalism makes the Lord sick. I think that is the plague of 
our American churches is that we learn the formalism. We learn what's expected of us, but our heart is not in it. Heart's not in it. Why? What, what indication do we have that our hearts are in it? I mean, what, what proof do we have that our hearts are not in it? The lifestyles afterwards and the value system that people place. All right? Uh, there's some things that bother me a little bit. And uh, I can't say them all the time because people get mad, will get mad at me. But I live in the day-to-day struggle of trying to su- keep the mission going. I mean, it's a, it's a constant thing. I know it's not up to me. God meets the needs. But those thoughts are always on my mind, you know, when I, oh, let's see, I have, you know, $1,200 rent at the house, $900 rent at the store, $650 power bill at the store, $650 power bill at the house. It's just the first of the month that I, all these things had to be paid. And that's not counting the water and the gas and the gasoline and all the other things that go. There's a lot of stuff, that just, just a lot of money. And so I go ask churches, oh, you support me. Help me do this. I'm trying to reach these men for God. We're pouring our life. Help, help me do this. And people will come up, and sometimes they'll give me, you know, money or whatever, or, you know, they'll support me. Churches support me for, you know, $75 a month. $25 a month. None of them support me 25 right now, but $50 a month, that's pretty common. Sometimes I get one that'll support me for 200 all right, sometimes. But these are churches, so these are bodies of believers, okay? I got a, an ad in the mail the other day to get me to subscribe to Dish Network. And the mid-range package for Dish Network is about $70, a month for a house just a couple right so how am I going to explain to God that I could not give $20 a month as a family to help drug and addicts alcohol addicts get off of drug and alcohol and introduce them to Jesus but I could spend $70 a month for my entertainment those are just values you understand what I mean by that? When you put it that way, it just slaps me in the face when I think about it because I look at my own life and I'm thinking, all right, where am I investing money in things that don't really matter? I'm not against entertainment. Sometimes you need, I understand all that, all right? But when you answer to God as a steward of the money that he gave you, and I'm willing to spend $70 a month that my family may be entertained, and a lot of that's trash anyway, but over the dusty, I, I, I'll be praying for you. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's fine. I, I don't have to answer for you. I just have to, have to answer for me, but I can't say that in churches. I, not if I want to come back. You know, they, they don't want to hear it. Right? But it's the honest truth is that our value system is messed up somewhere. Right? It's messed up somewhere. That I would consider this more important than reaching drug and alcohol addicts or whatever the case. Now, not everybody needs to support the mission. I understand that. But what I'm trying to say is that God's people have the money to fund God's work. The problem is it's in their pockets. <laughs> they don't want to give, all right? But they would invest it easily in, you know, movies and internet access and stuff like that. That's, sorry, that's a pet peeve of mine. I just, I can't say it in the churches I preach in like I want to, so I'm going to say it to y'all, all right? Just edit that out right there. All right, I wouldn't, I'm not fussing at anybody, uh, but I just want to be able to answer to the Lord and say, Lord, I was a good steward. Let's get started with your money. If you have cable TV, I'm not fussing at you about that. Just make sure your values are in the right place. Make sure that you're investing. You know, if I'm investing this much in my entertainment, what should I be investing in the souls of men? What should I be investing? Should it be equal? My entertainment versus the souls of men? At the very minimum, it should be equal, all right? But really, there should be no comparison. Right, and if it comes down to it, which do I need to sacrifice? Oh, I can't give this month because I've had a rough month, and you know, got a mortgage payment, and a boat payment, and a car payment, and my cable bill, and my internet bill, and my gun bill, and all the other stuff. I got to pay all these things, which are my my kingdom, and I'm building God's kingdom. You're gonna to have to wait, catch it next month. Yeah, that's that's how we think. That's how I think, and God's teaching me about those things. You know, when I'm spending my money every time I swipe that card, you know, wherever I'm doing in Walmart, or restaurants, whatever, buying me stuff like right and left. I'm, not against God giving me things. God likes to bless his children. He does. But how I value them is a real indication of where I'm at. The Bible says if riches increase, don't set your heart upon them. So 
Does that mean riches can increase? Yeah. God blesses some people a lot. Gives them a lot of stuff, right? He says, but don't ever set your heart on those things. And the real test of how I feel about something is how would I deal with it if God took it away? That's the real test about how, where, where my heart is in that thing, all right? I know people, and I've been guilty of this myself, that if my TV didn't work, I, I, want, I don't know what to do in the afternoons. You know, I, I, I don't know how to spend my evenings because that has become the consuming factor in my life, all right? And so sometimes it's a blessing when something breaks down. God gets us back to, hey, you, that's getting too much of your attention. You need to get this. And I jerked open my cabinet where I keep all my books, and I saw, mm, mm, I haven't read that. Oh, I need to read that. Oh, I need to read that. What's on TV? Uh, oh, you know that struggle? And you know that struggle? Yeah. When I know in my heart that my soul needs feeding, I had this buffet laid out before me. But this is meat. This is pork rinds and chocolate and, and ice cream and stuff like that. And yeah, it'll satisfy me for a little while, but I don't grow. So, so like this, you know, you know. And we as Christians get fat on the blessings of God instead of evaluating things the way he wants us to evaluate them. That external religion, that shallow formalism. We tip our hat to God. We do what we're expected to do as long as it doesn't interrupt too much of my time while I'm focusing on building my kingdom. All right. I don't know what God's called you to do, but he's called you to do something. It's not just eat, drink, and be merry. Tear down my barns and build bigger barns. No, that's not what he's called me to do. What can I do? Paul said, I made myself, making myself poor that she might be rich. And I'm giving my life for others. And in some respect, God wants you to do that. He may not call you to start a mission, but he wants you to do something. He's put you here for that purpose, to further his kingdom in the lives of somebody and you've got to take evaluation. This is the tools that I have financially, socially. How can I use these tools to further the kingdom of God? If my kingdom has to suffer because of it, so be it. This is the right kingdom. This is the foremost thing. As you read through the Word of God, you find that is a consistent principle. Consistent principle. Why does God not bless most of us with an abundance of money? You know, we, we can't be trusted. Can't be trusted. Can't be trusted to do with it the right way. Can't be trusted to give. People tell me all the time, oh, Brother Dusty, one day I'm going to win the lottery and I'm going to give a million dollars to the mission. I said, no, you won't. I know you've heard that story before about the preacher who talked to the farmer. He said, he said, Farmer Brown, if you had two barns, would you give one unto the Lord? He said, oh, preacher, <laughs> you know I would. He said, if you had two tractors, would you give one to the Lord? He said, oh, preacher, I'd give in a minute. He said, if you had two pigs, would you give one to the Lord? He said, come on, preacher, you know I got two pigs. You know I got two pigs. And that's the attitude. Would you give, if I had $10 million, I'd give $1 million to the church, would you? Would you if you have $10, would well, you give one to the church? If you won't give the one to the church, you definitely won't give the million, right? Because the attitude of our heart is not expressing the amount that we give but the way we evaluate things, the way we place value on them. And if I'm not willing to give all as a pauper, I sure won't give all as a rich man. Because the Bible says riches does something to a man's heart. It does. In fact, it makes it almost impossible for him to go to heaven were it not for the intervention of God in his life. And I've met a few Christian, wealthy Christians who gave. My son goes to Pensacola Christian College. That school was started almost by the philanthropy of Christian businessmen who gave and gave and gave, and they've invested it wisely, and they've built, they have built a billion-dollar empire, and I said billion with a B down there, of Christian education and Abeka books and all of these things. And uh, that's fine. They have to answer for all of that. I don't know all of that. But I, I talked to a pastor one time, and I asked him. Well, he was talking. I didn't ask him specifically, but in a service they said, how much of a balance do you carry every month? He said, nothing. Nothing. He said, we give it away and spend it just as fast as we can for the kingdom of God. He said, because the last thing I want is for Jesus to show up and I have $150,000 in the bank that could have been used to further his kingdom. Now, I understand that there's some wisdom in 
hey, if an air conditioned unit goes out, that is, boom, that's $10,000. I'm going to spend having that set aside to cover those things. But I also know churches right now. I'm not just arbitrarily throwing out numbers. My brother goes to a church who was asking the people in the church to pay to run their own vacation Bible school classes. If you run the class, would you buy the material for it? And the people were willfully giving. And my brother was in the bathroom, in the bathroom stall, and he, he heard the assistant pastor and another pastor of the church walk in and heard them talking about the fact that the church had $3 million in the bank. $3 million. $3 million. Baptist Church, Columbia, South Carolina. North side, you can look it up, all right? <laughs> <laughs> That's where my brother goes to church, and he was mad about it. Mad about it because his wife was one of the ones that was buying all the stuff for vacation Bible school. Three million dollars in the bank. Do you think as a pastor, if Jesus comes back and he finds you with three million dollars in the bank while there are homeless and hurting people all around you and the best that you can provide them is a box of canned goods in the midst of their need? That's all you can do with three million dollars in the bank? We have no right to fuss at the Catholic Church. We're doing the same thing on a small scale. Absolutely. God's called us to give of ourselves. And I don't mean go make yourself poor, and I don't mean that God didn't want to bless you. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. My whole point is that we need to get back to biblical evaluation about what really matters in life, right? God may bless you with an abundance, some riches, and a new car. Praise the Lord. Just don't let them steal your heart. He gave them to you to further his kingdom. Find out what he wants you to do with it and do it for his honor and glory. Take care of your family. Provide for your kids. If you don't do that, you're worse than an infidel, the Bible says. Take care of your family, right? But don't seek to fare sumptuously every day while the ministries of God struggle to keep their head above water all around you and you throw them your two or three cents at Christmas time and think that you've done your good deed because you dropped it into some ding-a-ling, ring a bell and a red kettle outside. That just, that, yeah. All that is is a conscience soother. And if you knew how that money was spent, you wouldn't give it to them anyway. All right, just stop. Sorry, that was my rant for the day. I get frustrated when I drive past their signs and it says the Salvation Army doing the most good. No, I, I understand. I, relatively speaking, compared to Goodwill and some other people, they spend a lot of money. But it's still not... Not when, when I hear about the lady who am from Charlotte who worked in the Salvation Army who made a million dollars, I that 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 kind of stuff burns me up. Burns me up. But all that aside, I wasn't up here just to bash other organizations. I'm just trying to explain to you the being in the type of ministry I'm in has helped me understand a little bit about how we Americans evaluate things. And sometimes it's a revelation for the fact that our heart is not really in building the kingdom of God. Our heart is in building our kingdom. And if we can give a little bit to the kingdom of God and help us feel better about ourselves, then we'll do so, right? And that's not what I find in the Bible. I find wholesale allegiance, wholesale allegiance. Missionaries, I believe God's called me to go to India. When are you leaving? Tomorrow. <laughs> I'm getting on a ship tomorrow. Do you have a job? No. I'll go over there and trust God to provide for me. And now missionaries, you know, it takes us five years to try to raise support, to get enough to go. Why does it take somebody five years to raise support? Because God's people don't give like they ought to. All right? I don't think any of that's in the book of Jeremiah, but it's, it probably is somewhere. All right, External religion. I'm going to stop. Stop. Verse number five. Y'all give me dirty looks anyway. Genuine repentance requires cessation of evil and a turning to God. Either one without the other is void. In other words, God wants me to stop doing wrong and turn to him and start doing right. I, this seems so elementary, but at the mission, this problem is repeated ad nauseum, all right? It's not enough to stop doing drugs and alcohol if you do not turn to God. It's not enough, all right, because you will stop doing drugs and alcohol as long as the accountability is there and the checks and balances are there, but as soon as you're put into the real-world situation of having means and opportunity, you'll fall on your face, because there's no power within you to resist it. No power to resist it. Now, how many men have I seen come through the mission? I've given them a certificate because they completed the program, and, man, they did so good. They don't even make it home. <laughs> you know, they're cutting lines on the certificate I gave them. You know, just, it's almost that bad. Why? It's nothing real. 
inside. Nothing real inside. Inside. I cannot just drive out the demons. In fact, what does the Bible say? The man who drove out the demon cleaned and swept his house. And the demon came back and found the house empty, came back with seven more. And every man that I've seen come to the mission and get clean from drugs and alcohol that goes back out into it, it is always much worse when he leaves the mission than when the first time he came to it. And it gets progressively so until he kills himself, unless something happens. All right? I cannot just take out this God of selfishness and addiction out of my life if I don't replace it with the God and begin to serve and worship Him, right? Can't have it both ways. All right. Oh, number six, sin extracts a high price. It ruins internally, externally, and eternally. There's your outline, James, for Sunday morning, all right? God is brokenhearted over the sin of His people as illustrated in Jeremiah's weeping. He is a picture of God who weeps over our sin. God's righteous cause will eventually triumph over evil. Truth pressed to the ground will always rise again. You know, what's his name? James Lowell, is that his last name? He wrote the poem, Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, but the scaffold shapes the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. It's a long poem. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. You never heard that poem? You uncultured swine. I guess you have to look it up on your own. Make a reference and nobody gets it. It's sad, huh? James Law. I think that's his name. I have it in my, on my iPad somewhere, but I think that's his name. I'm James Russell Lowell. Lowell. He's an American poet, and that is probably one of his most famous poems. And it starts off, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. But I repeat the part. Since y'all are looking at me just obliviously, it says, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. But the scaffold shapes the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch upon his own. And by the appearances of man, truth is always being crucified and hung, and wrong is forever winning. Behind it all, God is watching, and truth always wins in the end. That's, that's the whole point of the poem that he's making. It's the point of the book of Jeremiah. God can make it again another vessel. And we'll look at that passage in Jeremiah about the potter and the clay and those things when we get there. Number nine, the only hope for the world is through the Messiah and the new covenant. And we'll talk about that too in more detail. Those who uncompromisingly proclaim God's truth, refusing to condone evil, will suffer persecution. It's a matter of time in our country that this will come about even more so. Every man will ultimately have to stand before the judge of the universe and give an account for his life. Jeremiah makes that plain truth plain. All right? It's a simple thing, but we need to be reminded of, of it. I've listed for you how Jeremiah is like Christ. He was divinely called before he was born, rejected of his own people, suffered terribly at their hands, knew the pain of a brokenhearted love. He is one of the four outstanding types of Jesus in the Old Testament, that being Joseph, Moses, David, and Jeremiah. I'm going to give you a list of direct prophecies, which we will look at in more detail next time we are together. Since Jeremiah wrote most of Lamentations, let me go ahead and go over this sheet with you. Lamentations is called Lamentations because it is a book of lamenting, all right? Lamentations mean the crying and weeping. It is the brokenhearted sorrow over the result of sin. But even in a Lamentations, we find some hope because our sorrow is never without hope because God gives songs in the night, not after the night. And these songs were written during the darkest night. Most of these are attributed to Jeremiah. All the Lamentations but the third chapter are based on eyewitness accounts of the Chaldean or the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in 587 B.C. Striking features. These Lamentations are examples of Hebrew poetry. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but each chapter has 22 verses, except chapter 3, which has 66 verses, which is 3 times 22. Each chapter is built on an alphabetic acrostic with the first word of each verse following the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, except for chapter 5. Chapter 5 is more of an impromptu eulogizing at the end of it. What other passage of Scripture that can you think of that follows this pattern of using the Hebrew alphabet as the first letter of the verses? 
Psalm 119 does the same thing. All of the category, all 176 verses, start with the letter of the alphabet that heads that particular section. All right, as an example of Hebrew poetry. We find a lot of Hebrew poetry in Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. In fact, in the fall of the year since we are working our way backwards through the Old Testament starting with minor prophets and now major prophets we'll probably study Hebrew poetry and that'll be the books of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. All right, those great great stuff in there and we'll talk more about that if the Lord ever lets us do that. But that's what you're finding in the book of Lamentations. It is a book of poetry. 22 verses when you read over that. All right? This book reminds us of our great need of Jesus, our sin bearer, to deal with the wages of sin. And the well-known verses of 3, 22, and 23 were written while viewing the broken ruins of Jerusalem. What does 3, 22, and 23 say? It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Now, he is watching, he is stating this while he is watching the city burn to the ground. How is the faithfulness of God in view in the city burning? Because God's faithfulness is negative and positive. He's faithful to chastise you when you disobey. He's faithful to keep his word and bring about the consequences of your sin. We like to just sing about his faithfulness in the positive sense, and that's true too, but his faithfulness is there on the negative sense as well. You disobey, he's going to deal with you. He's faithful. I don't like that side of the faithfulness, but it's just as necessary as the good side, isn't it? All right. 339 shows that even among the destruction of the city, as long as I'm not in hell, I have no right to grumble. What does 339 say? Don't man for the that's right wherefore doth a living man complain a man for the punishment of his sin right are you living then you have no right to complain because you hadn't got what you deserve are we a complaining people well if God used the same treatment on us that he used in the children of Israel and sending fiery serpents among us to bite us when we complain we'd be covered with snake bite right 521 gives us our only hope for national repentance what does 521 say? Go ahead. Turn on. Good. Okay. He said, turn us and we shall be turned. What does the word turned there mean? Right? It's a, it's a repentance. All right? What has to happen in my heart for me to repent? Who does the turning first, according to this verse? Turn me, and I shall be turned, all right? For me to have true repentance, God has to do the turning, all right? It's not in my heart to turn from my sin, all right? Now, God allows that sin to bite me so that I want to turn from it, but that's all his work, all right? God removes all of the glory of man from the salvation process. If you turn from the sin because you hated it and it made you sick, it's because he made it hateful. He made it sickening. And you turn to him because in his grace he turns you. You can't turn without his turning, all right? He's the one who does these things. Turn me and I shall be turned, all right? And that is the only hope that we have. But notice the phrase. What is the last part of the verse there, Miss uh, Judy? Renew our days as of old. Right? Notice this quote at the end of the notes. God can give us the pastlessness of a newborn babe. When a baby's born, how many regrets does he have? What kind of past does he have? What do people judge him on? Just the beauty of his existence in the moment. Right? No past. No past. God can give us that. In his eyes, right? And give us the pastlessness of a newborn babe. I don't really care what you were before. What are you now? I'm wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I am a son of God. And I have certain inalienable rights that come with that position. And I plan to fully exercise them as I enjoy what God has given me in this life. All right? Next time we are together, we will cover some individual passages in Jeremiah and in Lamentations. 
All right? Questions? Somewhere, are you, are you, are you sick? Okay. Because your eyes look like you have a cold. Oh, good. That's even better. All right, good. Sorry. No, no, that's... I like it. I, if you get if you get teary out about.